Hi, my name's Matt Godbolt and I'd like to talk to you today about performance tuning and why there's no such thing as the fastest code. I am a programmer working for the trading firm DRW and I've been there for about seven years. Prior to that, I've worked at Google and I spent 10 years making video games for a living. So as you can imagine, performance has always been important to me. So in my current job, I am responsible for formatting and uh, sending the messages to the exchanges that buy and sell securities. So this um, would be uh, like we would like to buy a particular stock or a future and we would have a TCP connection to a uh, an exchange, say the, the, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the CME, and we'd say, hey, we'd like to buy some of these things for this price, please. And it's a very simple protocol, uh, at least the many exchanges who use this FIX protocol, it's a standardized financial interchange protocol. Um, it's it's ASCII, it's very simplistic, it's uh, just key equals value pairs separated by uh, the ASCII start of uh, handle, I forget SOH anyway, so the SOH byte which is just a one byte um, and terminated by a particular sequence 10 equals blah blah blah. It's not very efficient and it requires several binary to decimal conversions. If you think we are wanting to send a particular price, a particular uh, time and date, we have to put fields that represent all of those into a message. And um, the, the problem with that, of course, is that we need to do binary to decimal conversions. We have these values and prices that are in um, an internal representation, usually an integer, and we need to be able to output it. So um, it's not a very efficient uh, encoding, but everyone has to do it. So there's a bit of a race for those who are um, looking to place an order in an efficient and time sensitive manner to format the message and be able to send it out. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. Except that to make life a lot easier, I'm gonna invent a completely hypothetical order format, which just looks like this. So it's much more like an HTTP request or similar where we're just going to say new space and then the stock that we're interested in buying space and then the price space and then the quantity. So we could quite reasonably write a, fu a function to format an order that looks like this, where we return a string by value. We take the stock uh, price and quantity and uh, we format them using string streams and then we return the formatted string, which, you know, seems pretty reasonable, nothing too um, clever going on there, just a, exactly the first way that you would probably think to do it. Now you may or may not wish to pass a constant reference to the stock string or a const char star, um, the price may not be an integer, it may be some other price format um, and the quantity likewise, but it's broadly going to look something like this. So how fast do you think this function is? So how are we gonna find that out? I'm gonna run the function 100 million times and I'm gonna give it a bunch of different prices and quantities and then I'm gonna get the average amount of time it took. And just before I reveal how long that takes, have a little think yourself. How, how quickly do you think this function can run? Just an order of magnitude thing. Is it going to be milliseconds? Is it microseconds? Is it nanoseconds? Well, it turns out that takes 550 nanoseconds per order. This is measured on my desktop machine, a three and a half gigahertz Haswell. That's incredibly fast. And it was very surprising to me that that naive routine was as quick as that. But we can do better than that. Now, this link here takes us to a compiler explorer view, which shows us the code that I just had on screen here with the ID, the price and the quantity, and then the assembly code that's being emitted by the compiler. Now there is no um, substitute for measuring the performance of your code, but just eyeballing the amount of assembly code that has been generated gives some idea about the amount of work that we're asking the compiler to do. There's pages and pages of it down here. Of course, that may be very, very fast, so we have to measure it, but something is definitely up there. So can we do better than that? Well, let's first of all, let's profile it and see where we're spending our time. I'm going to use perf here. Perf is an excellent 
performance analyzer built into the Linux. Um, a, a simple sudo at get will get hold of it on almost every distribution or YAML or the equivalent. And I'm just going to record running my little application and then I'm going to get a report. This surprised the heck out of me. I had no idea that the time spent would look like this. My instinct before I did this uh, recording uh, was that the uh, construction and destruction of all the strings would be the bottleneck, that there would be lots of malloking going on behind the scenes or free, new and deletes to hold the space that the strings would live in and that there would be some cost associated with the string stream and I'd expect that the formatting routines inside of the string stream would show up, but not in my wildest dreams did I imagine that dynamic cast would be the top of the list and at the third way down, third down there'd be a, a string comparison. There is no string comparison in any of the code that I wrote, I'm certain, but obviously that's taking some time. Now of course there is some time being taken by free and some insertion into an O stream which makes sense to me um, but there's, there's, it's really surprising so let's drill down a little bit more. So this is the call stack for dynamic cast. I ran my application and I put a breakpoint on underscore underscore dynamic cast and I said what the heck is the stack here? What is the backtrace? And so you can see that here's the new order. It calls basic string stream which calls through all these different things here. This is all done with minus O3 so it says full optimization with admittedly a relatively old GCC. I think this is GCC 5. But um, during the construction of the IO stream in object here, IOS in it is being called and some cache locale and has facet and then dynamic cast. What on earth is this? So let's drill down further. We, we start looking at the source code now, which is pretty warty to have to do, but you know, we're on a journey of discovery. Here is what m underscore cache underscore locale looks like. It's hugely complicated because of all of the extra underscores that the standard library is required to use, but um, it's not really that complicated. It's it's using a has facet um, with a bunch of different types and uh, it's trying to see whether or not the lo locale that it's been given has a particular facet it seems and if so it caches various things about those facets. Now facets are a very uh, unusual dark corner of uh, string streams as are indeed our locales and certainly in our order formatting code we don't really even want locales to play a part. The, the locale is unimportant to us. We do not wish comma separators or different things, uh, periods instead of commas to be used and su such like, or well, other way around. So we don't want locales anyway, but l let's see where this rabbit hole leads. So this is now has facet. And my best guess is that it's a template function that says, does the locale have this particular facet where a facet is a particular class type or a type name here, this underscore facet. And it looks like there is a static method inside the facet underscore MID which returns some unique ID. Um, there's The locale has some kind of magical pointer behind the site scenes and if the ID of the facet type that it's trying to see if it has or not is within the size of the possible facets uh, and the dynamic prop type of the object at underscore underscore facets underscore underscore i is a const facet star, then it's going to return it. So it looks like it's doing some kind of checking to see whether or not something in a slot that it has been imbued with matches a particular dynamic type. And this is where all the time is being taken. So the construction of the string stream has, through many layers, come down to this thing where it is trying to work out what kind of locale um, is to be used. And it turns out that the dynamic cast behind the scenes actually uses a string comparison. So inside the V table of the object, underscore fa facets i, there is some kind of string type um, and the dynamic cast checks to see whether or not the, the facet star matches the expected type inside the facets, underscore, underscore facets there. Uh, that's why there was the uh, string comparison routine that was in there uh, in the call uh, in, in the um, performance analysis. So that's crazy. All of this work here. I'm just going to go back and have a look here. 
Um, this string comparison is basically another part of the dynamic cast. Um, and, uh, the, you know, 26% plus 5%, 30% of our application is just determining what, if any, locale we have set. And we don't really want a locale anyway. So let's try again. This is take two. Rather than using the newfangled C++ streams, let's fall back and go back to the world of, of pretty much C using sprintf. And here I'm going to take a whole bunch of liberties with regards to having a buffer that we're going to print into that the pr caller is going to provide us with. And that buffer we are going to assume, very dangerously, that the buffer is big enough for us to format any of our messages into it. So in real production code, we couldn't do this, but this is just example code to sort of get a sense for how much time we can save doing these kind of tricks. So we're taking a char star to the output buffer, we're taking a const char star to the stock, and then we're taking our price and quantity, and then we're just using a printf style string. How quick is this? So this one takes 130 nanoseconds per order. That's four times faster than the stood string uh, equivalent or the string buff. That was 550 nanoseconds, if you remember. And let's just quickly take a look at the compiler explorer link for this. And pretty much as you'd expect, the code has gone to almost nothing. Although let's let's be clear about this. The user code has gone to nothing. We are just setting up a few parameters and moving things around between registers. And then we're just jumping to the sprintf routine inside uh, the libc. So work, obviously, and plenty of it will be done in that sprintf routine. But at least we're not contributing to it in this case. So let's profile it. Now we're spending 47% of our time in a function called vf printf, 20% in io default xs put n, 10% in strichol null, and 7% in i2a word. Now each of these links to the source code, but I'm not going to go to each of these in turn. Uh, the vf printf is the workhorse function that all of the printf style routines use. So printf, sprintf, vs printf, f printf, all except these um, template strings or format strings and a set of parameters to be formatted. And they all do effectively the same thing, but they output to different places. So printf will obviously step right out to standard out, f printf writes to a file, s printf writes to memory, and so on. And the libc implementation of those uses this virtual fprintf. And that function calls out to write a byte. So the vfprintf is called with the parameters to the sort of printf-like uh, um, format string and, and uh, verargs parameters. And um, it's given a, a, a function to call to put each byte effectively. And in the case of printf, it will put to the um, standard out. In the case of s printf, it will go to this io default xs put n, which will write it into the buffer that was provided by sprintf. So this is almost like a virtual function call you can think of written in C, where fprintf writes out to a sort of an interface to where the bytes need to go. And that's great. So um, they save an awful lot of uh, code duplication, but there's a cost associated with fprintf having to, vfprintf, sorry, have to call out to an unknown function. But, you know, 50% of the time in fprintf, that's the work we're asking it to do. It's not too surprising that it's spending 50% of its time there. 20% actually writing to uh, um, a uh, uh, the, our, our char star buff. Surprising, but maybe not not uh, not that surprising. And then structural null. What on earth is that doing there? Well, structural null apparently is a function which searches for a particular character, a provided character, or the end of a string. And in this particular instance, it's being used to look for the percent character or the end of the string. And that's because that format string needs to be parsed. And so the vfprintf function uses structural null to run forward, skipping over bytes that are uninteresting to it until it hits either the end of the string or a percent character. And if it hits the end of the string, it's done. It can just put out the bytes that it skipped over. 
if it hits a percent, it needs to put out the bytes up to the percent, and then it needs to parse the percent and then do either the percent D or the percent S or all of the other things that printf does. So we're spending 10% of our time, and probably some of the time inside VF printf, parsing our format string. And of course, our format string is the same every time. We're doing that work over and over again, even though there's really nothing new to parse. It's, it's the same, same format over and over again. Last of all, we've got 7% of our time or 6.8% of our time in I2A Word. This is the integer to ASCII conversion workhorse inside the standard library. You might reasonably think that that should be the, the, the place where the time is spent. That is, the majority of the work that we're actually asking it to do is turning our integer representations into ASCII representations. So of all the time spent, 50% in VFPrintF, 20% there, so that's 70, plus another 10%, that, that is getting off for 80% of the time is probably spent just formatting and copying bytes around in a very complicated way, and only 7% of the time is spent doing any kind of conversions. So I think we can do better than that. So let's have a think about this. We don't need the full generality of printf. We don't need to parse these strings ahead of time. We know what we're going to be formatting. So let's create a custom formatter that's only going to work for our particular use case. And then if we can get rid of that 80% of format, uh, formatting and parsing the format string, then our bottleneck will be that underscore I2A word equivalent. And perhaps we can do better than that too with the knowledge of the particular values and things that we're doing. So how do we do I2A? Just think about it. If you have a number in an integer and you wanted to turn it into an ASC its ASCII representation, what would you do? Well, here's one way to do it. Let's find the rightmost digit. We know that that is the remainder if you divide by 10. So that gives us the rightmost digit of a number. Then to get the next number, we're going to divide our value by 10, which sort of shifts it down by one decimal place. And then we're going to get the remainder again to get the second to last digit and so on. So we can just keep on dividing and modulusing by 10 to pull out each digit one at a time. But of course, the digits come out in reverse order, and it's not actually trivial to get them out the right way around. So we might going to have to do something about that. There's going to be a bit of code now, quite a bit of C code, and I'm just going to quickly go through what this format class is. This is just skeleton bits. Um, we've got a buffer of 2k, which is ample for all the strings we're going to be talking about. We're going to have a pointer which says whereabouts in that buffer we're currently writing. We're going to have a couple of append routines that take either a char, which just writes into the buffer, that char, and increments the pointer, or a null terminated string, which just keeps copying bytes from that null terminated string until it hits the end. Note that it doesn't leave a null terminator inside the buffer. It doesn't copy the null. We have a finish routine, which does actually append a null byte on the end so that we can make a C style string at the end of it. And then we're going to have two routines, one to append a decimal value, and then to append a decimal value, which we know to be non-negative. So this one will take an integer, and this one takes an unsigned value. What does our decimal append look like? Well. The first thing we're going to do is to see if our value is less than zero. If it is, we know it's negative. So we're going to put a minus sign, and then we're just going to flip the value and use the non-negative version. Now, if you are dealing with the full generality of all integer values that we can represent, this is not in general safe to do, because if you have the, the smallest value, negative value, then you can't flip it forward. Um, you can't do this in, in all cases. So be aware that the range of this is taken to be relatively small values, nowhere near int max or int min. So this handles the neg negativeness of our number, and then we fall through into decimal append non-neg. And this is one implementation of what decimal append non-neg could look like. We've got an unsigned value that we're going to be uh, turning into a decimal, an integer. Uh, yes, an integer into a decimal. We're going to remember where we started. 
and then we're going to sit in a loop going round until we at hit uh, zero. Now it's a do while, so that even if we come in with a value of zero, we're going to go round at least once and write out the single zero digit. It's not often you get to use a do while, but here it seemed appropriate. We're going to append the value mod 10 plus the car value of uh, the ASCII zero, so that's 48 if you're, you're playing along at home. We're going to take value percent 10 plus 48 and we're going to append it. And then we're going to divide value by 10 to get down the next digit. And then as I said, we're going to keep going around until we've run out of uh, number. And then of course, we've written this number out, but it's backwards. So we're going to do a simple switch where we start from the end and we switch the end with the start and then we move the start forward and move the end back by one and uh, this will reverse the digits in place. So that's pretty cool. We we know that we've just written to it, so they're all in cache. Um, there are some hazards to do with the load to store forwarding stuff, but there's not, nothing to worry about there from a microarchitectural point of view, which is of course where, I, where I'd like to think about. But this should work. We're gonna be uh, writing out the value backwards and then we're gonna be spinning it the right way around. Let's take a look at what that inner loop is, that do while. This is the append value percent 10 plus zero and then value divided by equals 10. Let's see what the assembly code looks like. Surprisingly, there is no divide or modulus instruction here. Now, on the x86, there is no modulus instruction as it happens. The divide always gives us both a divide and a mod together. But the compiler has been smart enough to realize that we are dividing and multiplying sorry, dividing and modulusing by a constant value. And so it is chosen to multiply instead. And it's multiplying by this CCCCCD value, which just happens to be a fixed point representation of one over a 10. So what it's really doing is it's multiplying by the reciprocal. And then it has to do a little bit of monkeying around to shift the, the result back down. But ultimately these instructions are the same as as um, dividing and modulusing by 10. Or rather, this is the divide by 10. To get the modulus, it's going to find the remainder by doing multiplying up by 5 and then doubling it, which gives us edx times 10. So we've taken the thing we divided down by 10, multiplying it back up again by 10, and then we're going to look at the remainder, that is the, the value um, left over. Um, so if we had the value 17, at the end of this point here, we would have the value 1 because 17 divided by 10 is 1. We would multiply the 1 back up by 10 to get 10. We would subtract 17, our original number, from 10 to get 7. That's the remainder. And then we're going to add 48, which is the ASCII 0, to that and store it out. So there's our 7. And then we've got our 1 left over. That will go round and be used as the value for the next iteration around the loop. So this is the whole thing. This is this is just a, a compare missing off the bottom and a branch to the top. It's pretty cool. And it doesn't use any expensive instructions. It's only using a single multiply, which is pretty cheap on x86. Compilers are really smart. So finally, this is what our new order routine looks like. We're gonna be given a format object and we've been given our stock, price and quantity and we're just going to append the new bit part. We're going to append the name of the stock, a space, the price, a space, a non-negative value. We happen to know that quantities cannot be um, negative, so we might as well take advantage of that. And then we're going to finish. So how quick is all that? This takes 20 nanoseconds per order. That is around about 100 CPU clock cycles. You can't really get too much better than that, you'd think. It's 27 f times faster than the first take and six and a half times faster than the second go. If we profile this take three, you can see that we're now spending 95% of the time in our function and then 5% of the time is just spent in the main routine, the, the, the test driver. So we now know that there's no other work going on other than the stuff that we're, being, we're asking the computer to do, which is great, but if we wanted to improve on this, we'd have to do a, an instruction level profile. We haven't got it broken down by function. We've only got it broken down by instruction. And so we can ask Perf to report on the individual instructions and see where the time is being taken. And so here is the percentage of time spent on each instruction within the main part of the loop. And you can see that the, the 
apparently the place where most of the time is spent is in this shift right instruction which seems extremely unlikely as we we know shift right is is um pretty much the simplest thing a, a, a cpu could do so this is where we are starting to run into the limitations of what the instrumentation can do the way that perf works is to set up an interrupt that happens after a certain number of cpu cycles and then say where were you so it's forever interrupting the processor and saying, where were you? And it writes it down in a table and then later on is used to say, well, where do these samples land? If I, if I run um, for you know, 30 seconds or, or a couple of minutes and I interrupt every thousand or hundred thousand CPU cycles and then I find out and add up all the times I hit each individual instruction, that gives me a kind of heat map as to what, where the time is being spent. And it seems that this shift right is being hit more often than not. But because CPUs are notoriously out of order, the guarantees they make about when interrupts happen are not very strong. So my instinct here is that this multiply, which is I know to be a slower instruction than a shift, is where most of the time is being spent. And it's just that the interrupt happens while the multiply is in the pipeline, but until the pipeline has been flushed out, um, instructions after it can complete, and then the interrupt is taken. So this will lead to us to, to sort of miscount instructions around and about the actual slow instruction. And it looks like this poor shift right here is the, uh, the culprit who's taking the blame for the multiply. So there's not too much we can do about that multiply, you'd think. It's just a, a fact of life now. We've reached the fastest we can go, right? Um, I have some links that I will put in the, the, the notes uh, for this I2A and the full version. And, you know, we, we, can we do better than this? Well, of course we can. Now, I haven't got as many slides for this last bit because this is now I went off into the weeds a little bit. Um, but the best thing I've come up with so far, and I'm aware that there are libraries out there that use techniques like these. Um, these slides were written a few years ago, and um, I've just spruced them up to, to present on YouTube. Um, but the best way that I could come up with with a friend at work is to uh, is to do two digits at a time. So that allows us to do x percent 100 and x divided by 100. The compiler is still clever enough to come up with a magic constant that, div that allows us to divide a modulus by 100 using a multiply. And then we get a value out between 0 and 99. Then we can use a table where each entry of the table is two bytes long and it represents the two digits o in ASCII of um, the the two numbers that you want to that, that you've got so far so you can then do two digits effectively at a time and you can use binary coded decimal tricks if you like as well that's another way of doing it but the simple way is to have a table of a hundred two characters and look up in that to get your two bytes at a time and then um, we'll do the middle bit in a second but then you can generate if you know how many digits ahead of time, you can ge generate a, a bespoke routine for that many digits. Now, that, in, in my case, I used a template um, with a type name on, um, sorry, with a type parameter uh, which takes the uh, uh, the value n, so an n print n digits effectively, where uh, n is a template parameter, and that allows us to very efficiently do the um, two at a time until you have only one digit left, and then you have to do the one digit at a time. Uh, trick and of course then the compiler can see for example if it's a five digit number it will do uh, two and then two and then one the compiler can see that all of the results um, for each individual step can be uh, factored out and in fact it can generate code that starts to do the mod and div for both the 100 and the uh, 100,000 sorry 10,000 and the 100,000 so all of those can go off in parallel and it go, turns out to be very, very quick indeed. So the compiler, given the information ahead of time, can do a really, really good job. The trick, of course, is that we need to know what that value n is. And that's not easy to find out. If you think about, given the value n, how many, or rather, given the value x, how many digits are there in the ASCII representation of x? It would be ideal if we had a base 10 logarithm. That gives us the answer. 1 plus log 10 of x is the number of digits we need. We don't have a log 10. Log 10 is quite an expensive thing to, 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 uh, to calculate, but we do have log 2. Log 2 says how many times do I need to shift to, um, to find the top 
bit. Um, sorry, to find the position of the top bit. So there are count and lead zero instructions. CLZ is the count leading zero. That's a, an instruction on x86 which says how many zero bits are there at the top of this number. And then we can find out how many bits down there are by doing 31 minus that if it's a 32 bit number. Obviously this works for 64 bit numbers as two. That gives us the log two. So we now know what the log two of x is. Now, if you remember grade school, there is a relationship between all of the different logs. Log 10 of x is log 2 of x times the log of 2 over the log of 10. For all the digits that we would care about, a good representation of log 2 over log 10, which is about 0 0.3, 0103, is 1233 over 4096. Why did I pick over 4096? Well, because dividing by 4096 is just a shift so we can multiply by 1233 and then shift down to divide it by 4096 this is very similar to the tricks the compiler uses to do its multiply um, or rather to turn its divider modulus into multiplies so with all of these tricks i was able to get it down to 13 nanoseconds in order now that's not that much faster than our previous uh, example where we were doing it in 20 nanoseconds. So one could, I mean, it's proportionately a lot faster, but it's only shaving seven nanoseconds. So you might not want to worry about it at that point. And let's just have a quick look at what the code looks like over here in Compiler Explorer. So I've got all the code over here. There's the funny case statements here where I'm switching on the number of digits and then each case, I'm horribly using a macro. I know it's horrible. Um, is using this decimal pad append for that number of digits. So I'm using the template um, function there. This is where we take the dynamic value that we know, that we've worked out, the, the number of digits in this particular value, and effectively jump out to the routine who is uniquely written for that many digits. And, you know, the code is out here and it's huge. So again, code size is not necessarily a very good indicator at all of how fast something is going to be. But you can see that the compiler has done some clever things by generating all these different um, uh, multiply values. There's not a divide in sight and there's no loops or anything. It's just straight line code. So that's pretty cool. I'll put a link to this in the, um, the, the notes of this particular example. And uh, yeah, there's 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 the full number of digits there. The the problem about the um, shifting down. So this is uh, multiplied by twelve thirty three, divided by four thousand and ninety six. Problem with this is an approximation. There's some rounding errors, which mean that sometimes it gets it wrong. So um, you have to use a table, or this is how I've done it anyway. A, a table of like um, taking the approximate value, looking at the table, and seeing if it's right or not. And if it's wrong, then we need to just adjust it. So there's it, there's a bit more subtlety than you might imagine. But it's it's good fun, um, and uh, yeah, 17 or 13 nanoseconds in order. You you got to be pretty pleased with that. It's worth noting, of course, that this is not production trading code. Um, this is just me mucking around in my spare time to write things that look a little bit like what I do in my day job. A real trading system has an awful lot more than this. Um, most importantly, are things like safeties and tests. Um, obviously it's incredibly critical that um, we react and uh, work uh, correctly in the market um, abiding by all of the thing the safeties that we um, that we're required to have and we need to be certain that our code is doing what we expect it to so the testing is incredibly important and then just as a, a trading system needs to networking um, needs to be able to talk to the the network and networking side of things is very important there's obviously a trading algorithm in there which we didn't even talk about and i really can't talk about and then there's logging and auditing and such like that so there's an awful lot more than just formatting a bit of ascii and sending it um down uh, a network connection so thank you for listening i hope this has been interesting um there i'm as i say i'm on twitter and i this my email address is here um there are some other interesting talks on this subject by uh, Carl Cox. Um, you should definitely check those out if you're interested in, in this kind of topic. He goes into more detail about the kind of things trading companies do. I will put links also for those. But if you've enjoyed this, please uh, like it. And if you like this kind of talk, then please do subscribe.
Thank you.